Hi everyone, um, my name is Maxime Ripa. I'm one of the co-maintainers of the Theorem Mist tree, which for those of you that are not um, particularly involved in, in the Linux side of things, um, is a Git tree that is taking care and merging all the patches for all the small drivers that don't have a lot of uh, developers involved. Um, so drivers like the one for embedded SOCs and, and so on. And today I'd like to discuss with you um, some issues I find in, in, in the Theorem Mist tree in general. Um, hopefully uh, suggest a workaround and um, yeah, to hopefully tackle um, this particular issue and work to getting towards a more reliable display stack on those others. Um, so the first thing we need to um, acknowledge is that uh, KMS basically succeeded um, thanks to the massive effort to make Durham KMS easier um, that started like a decade ago. Um, we now have like 60 KMS drivers in tree and getting one or two new drivers each release, which is great. Uh, the amount of development per release of Linux is around a bit less than 2000, uh, which is huge. Um, it's basically a six of um, yeah the whole the whole of Linux development efforts every release, and both of, of these things. So um, the fact that KMS is now much easier than it used to be, um, and that there is a huge amount of development um, made. FBDev, which was a former display API in Linux, pretty much irrelevant these days. Um, as far as I know, there's no longer any development involved. Um, it's basically just a low maintenance effort uh, fixing like huge issues, and that's pretty much it. The only thing that remains from FBDev nowadays is the user space API. Um, and mostly because of the frame buffer console. Um, but we have more and more um, user space components that are moving towards KMS um, and abandoning FBDev. And hopefully at some point we'll be able to remove FBCon entirely um, and get rid of FBDev. So it became the standard these days um, with all the drivers and display related features that are only targeting KMS. And on the maintenance front, uh, part of the uh, uh, effort that I mentioned above was to actually create a lot of helpers to be able to share most code between drivers, which means that um, nowadays it works so well that a very simple device can have a driver of about four to 500 lines of code, which is like really compact. Um, and so the use of helpers everywhere with, um, together with the, like, um, so we only have um, the actual device specific components in, in the drivers, and those components are supposed to be um, written in hooks with a clear set of semantics, very well documented. So we know what expectations we have from the drivers, and so it makes it Pretty, pretty easy to maintain given its, its size. However, um, well, part of the success is that there's a lot of features and a lot of use cases that have been implemented by the core. Um, and so while it definitely works, I guess, for big drivers that have dedicated teams, um, in Durham MISC, what we see is that we mostly have part-time developers that don't really have the time to invest in um, getting to know each, how each feature works, how each feature is supposed to be used, um, to know each use cases. And so it's fairly easy to overlook or underestimate some of those use cases or features. Um, to downright misunderstand them uh, or misunderstand their requirements or side effects or yeah, basically the impact and implication that using that feature could have on your driver. And it can even be difficult to test them easily um, because some 
advanced features might not be exposed by the user space or by the user space that is running on your platform. For example, if um, some feature is only usable by, say, Android and you don't have an Android port on your platform, then you obviously won't port the entire key of Android just to be able to test that feature on your device. Um, so yeah, it's fairly difficult for part-time developers to get exactly what are the expectations from the driver. And um, if we're looking at um, the at this graph, um, it's it's basically a graph where in X you have all the KMS drivers um, that we have in four dot no five dot fourteen sorry, um, and in the Y axis the number of contributors that have on average submitted more than one patch every release since the introduction of the driver in Linux. Um, and so we see that all basically all the desktop grade um, drivers are having a lot of contributors that are active. So drivers like AMDs, um, Intel, Nouveau, uh, a few embedded grade drivers have that as well. So like Exynos and MSM for Qualcomm SOCs and Exynos being for Samsung's. And then you have a long trail of basically all the other devices and all the other drivers that have one or two at best developers being active. And um, well, one patch every release is a fairly low bar still. Um, and so um, we clearly see that on those drivers, we don't really have like a full time team. Basically, it's usually a couple of developers working on it on the side, aside from other things. Um, I can only imagine that, for example, for all the ARM SOC devices, they basically maintain the entire platform and KMS driver being one of the drivers that they have to take, in, um, to take into account and maintain, but they don't have to, they basically can't and won't invest full time into the driver. And so getting the knowledge of the core of basically what I was saying before is basically a non a showstopper for them. Um, and so it's going to introduce a few issues uh, purely because of lack of knowledge and on those drivers, lack of review as well by someone that knows, basically. Um, and it's even worse uh, when you take into account the that the hardware is barely accessible to other developers. So um, the controllers themselves might not be easy to access. Uh, they might be proprietary, confidential, not produced anymore, um, not produced yet. Um, so it's, yeah, it might not be easy to get access to one of those controllers um, or GPUs. And even if you do get one of them and one platform using them, uh, they might not expose all the hardware features that the drivers can implement. And so you won't be able to test everything, basically. Uh, so we end up in a situation where we have kind of two groups. Um, we have the people with the hardware that don't have the knowledge um, of um, the framework in depth uh, and don't really know what to test, basically. And people with the in-depth knowledge of the framework and would be able to know um, what what to test, how to test, and make proper review, don't have access to the hardware and don't have the time to care for all those drivers anyway. So it's kind of an issue, really. Um, and so it leads to some situations like this one that is still currently happening, unfortunately, on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so it initially started with um, the introduction of HDMI streaming support. Um, which is um, required for HDMI modes above 4K and 60 Hertz, including 4K and 60 Hertz. And so this is basically a change in the transmission mode of the HDMI um, link. And so you would have to notify the um, display, basically, that you have changed that transmission mode so that 
both the emitter and uh, receiver can agree on it and the display actually display the frame. Otherwise, um, the monitor won't sync and you would get nothing on the, on the, on the display. Um, so, um, unfortunately with this, or fortunately, I mean, it, it makes sense, uh, when, you when you disconnect the display after it's been set up using the scrambler and then reconnect it, obviously it, it will have lost its scrambler status so you also have to um, determine uh, if and when the display is connected and removed from the system. And so we basically have two ways of dealing with this in KMS. The first one is polling, um, and the, where basically the call will pull every 10 seconds, if I remember right. Um, to see if, well, to point the driver basically to have um, the connection status with the display, uh, and if something changed, then it will report it. And but obviously, uh, ten seconds is quite a lot, so disconnecting and reconnecting it um, might be an issue um, if you do it fast enough, or if you have something on the other end that doubles the hot plug uh, line fast enough. Um, so we, and then you have uh, support for interrupt based hot plug detection, which is better since you can react to all of those events, but not all drivers or platforms are supporting it. And it's basically what was happening for the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, we, the early, well, not all Raspberry Pis uh, were able to rely on interrupts and there were some issues with the with some of them on the GPIO um, that provided the, um, well, HPD signal. Um, and so you wouldn't be able to use interrupt on those. So basically the driver was support was supporting polling only. Um, but since only the Raspberry Pi 4 um, had the support for the HMI scrambler and um, it had as well the interrupt, uh, support for hot plug detection. Um, the second uh, pull request I did was to enable those interrupts um, and be able to report um, the hot plug based on interrupts properly. As soon as I did that, however, someone came along and basically when whenever um, his TV was shut down, I think, we had a CPU crash um, and the system would completely stole silently. Um, and it turns out that now that we were able to detect um, those hot plug pulses, um, that the user space application that user was using uh, actually would disable the display output when the display was reported as disconnected, which made sense, right? Um, and would then still try to do a CSE, an HDMI CSE access um, on that connector, which um, since the output was disabled, the controller was powered down and a powered down controller on, on the Raspberry Pi 4. If you, if you happen to do a register write, a read or write on one of, on one of those um, controllers, uh, you basically stole the whole bus, um, which was explaining the um, system stall and silent. Um, so yeah, we fixed that, fortunately. Uh, but then we would get another um, another bad report where um, if you were running your TV in 4K uh, and then you would put it in standby, re, um, turn it on again, then uh, the display would stay uh, black. And it turns out that um, if you basically what that TV was doing, um, what that TV was doing at the moment was that it was creating an HPD pulse to basically fake that the display was disconnected and reconnected. The kernel was um, was detecting it properly, but since it was exactly the same um, 
modes exposed by the TV before and that mode was completely fine with whatever was running on it. We never had a new mode set occurring and so nothing ever sent um, to the display the notification that it was supposed to enable um, the scrambling as well. And so we would have um, an emitter transmitting with a scramble enabled and the display um, receiving without it, um, which was explaining the black screen. And so it turns out that the proper, um, the proper way to do this is basically when in the detect hook um, that the uh, driver uh, provides to the system, um, we were um, we were actually if if the display was reconnected and no mode has changed, we would notify the display again, and so everything works. Except it didn't, uh, because we had exactly the same issue coming up with Cody, um, and it turns out that um, so in our interrupt handler, basically we would notify the KMS core and the KMS core would call back into our detect hook um, and that detect hook would provide to the core the connection status um, but that um, notification to the core and then the call back to the hook was done through a helper and we used the wrong one um, we used the wrong one and we used one that would just send um, to the user space the kernel event that something had changed on that device, but we never actually called the detect hook in our driver. And this was working for some application uh, on the bug before because those applications did have um, support to listen to those kernel events from the user space. And so the first thing they did when, um, well, when the, the um, hot plug event was coming in was to actually query the driver to know the display status and thus calling a detect hook that we had implemented. But Cody doesn't support all of this. Um, so Cody never actually called into detect either. And so we ended up never calling detect. So here the obvious fix was to switch to another helper that was actually calling detect and reporting reporting it properly and everything was fine until someone came along saying um, that since that patch, um, whenever they would wake up the TV using CEC, um, we, they would basically end up into what looks like a deadlock uh, for some reason. And I still don't really know why at the moment because it came up just last week and I haven't had time to investigate it yet. Um, but yeah, my point here being that um, basically you have a lot of, um, from, the um, from the framework and drivers, uh, you have quite a lot of expectation. Not all of them are very well documented. For example, the fact that you could um, do a CC access while the HDMI controller was disabled uh, was documented pretty much nowhere. Um, so part of that fix was to add that documentation. Um, the fact that you had to restore the scrambler status in the detect um, in the fourth item was, wasn't was documented, I think. Uh, on the fifth item, um, the documentation was misleading um, and I misunderstood it. Um, so we have kind of all those issues uh, coming at once. Um, which just kind of proves my point, I guess. And it's hard for everyone to know all of them. Um, and without knowing all of them, we are kind of, kind of have to like uncover one bug after another, um, which is kind of frustrating and not very efficient. Um, so we could just use CI, right? Especially all those issues of basically fairly standard behavior that could basically happen with any device um, that can do HDMI, CC, and um, 4K, uh, which is fairly common these days. And so we should be able to test them and they should be reported some by some kind of CI. Um, and we basically have two 
almost two options. Um, the first one is GitLab, um, which could be very useful to do so. Um, it's being discussed. Uh, Mesa moved to it, but the kernel didn't yet. Um, so it could be useful, but it's not a thing yet. Um, one of the issues when it's going to be a thing is also how do you like get that branch that you just tried to merge into um, tested into a device, which Martin is probably going to have some ideas about um, earlier this afternoon, uh, later this afternoon, sorry. Uh, but you still have to deal with that. And then you have kernel CI, which is uh, fairly useful these days. Um, they have a lot of bolts, a lot of access to a lot of hardwares, um, a lot of tests, but they don't have any display tests, um, which we could provide, I guess. But then comes the questions of um, which tools should we run? Um, and the obvious first candidate is IGT. Uh, which, as you probably all know, is an extensive test suite which, which has tests for both um, display and rendering um, drivers. And for both generic and vendor-specific features, it's great. Uh, it's even greater since nowadays, with this new policy, you have to have, for every new feature um, that you want to provide in KMS, you have to have a matching IGT test. So it only expands its reach, and it's a good thing. There's approximately 2,000 tests. Um, it's, well, it's well maintained. With this policy, it basically tests and documents pretty much everything. Um, so it's yeah awesome. Except that it fails a bit on some devices that are in the RAM MISC, and we're going to see a bit about the shortcomings. The first big one is how you get IGT onto those devices. devices. Uh, there's a fairly big number of dependencies, uh, and a fairly big one, like Kero is in there, um, which, in order to compile it, pretty much requires that you use like some kind of real distributions, so things like Debian, Fedora, um, which probably doesn't work on some of those devices. Um, the cross compilation, since you have so many of those dependencies, is basically a non starter. Uh, there's too many of them, you would need to have some kind of custom tail chain. Uh, it's very hard. Um, and Docker helps, um, but marginally. Uh, you can't always have either Docker or Podman on those platforms, again, because of size requirements. And Still, uh, a build of IGT with um, the Debian minimal Docker file takes around 700 megabytes, which is, mm, depending on where, what your use cases are, can be not a lot or way too much. And if we are looking at what a typical embedded device is, and basically what the lowest common device on those DRM MIS drivers, it it's basically not that great. Uh, you would expect um, one CPU, uh, basically 64 megabytes of RAM or more, if you're lucky. A GPU from time to time, um, around 128 megabytes of flash, flash storage, which is going to be probably some slow NAND that doesn't handle a lot of writes. Um, so you can't just put a Debian in there, uh, you can't compile in there because it will just kill your flash. Um, and you have a weak, and a weak CPU and don't have a lot of RAM. Uh, you have no network and you probably would have more internal um, display interfaces like DSi or LBDS rather than external ones like HDMI or DisplayPort. So uh, there's kind of a cultural clash in here, and we can see that IGT really doesn't work on those devices. The next thing is uh, that IGT supports test suits uh, because there's a huge number of tests, and so in order to be able to run uh, 
a given number of tests um, in a reproducible way. Um, test suits are great for that. Uh, there's basically two or three users, depending on how you're counting, which are Intel and Raspberry Pi. Um, and it's it's great, but Intel is using a lot of them. Uh, Raspberry Pi is basically using test suits only for the Raspberry Pi specific um, API, so basically the GPU. And it's if you're not really um, knowledgeable about IGT, it's fairly hard to see which tests you want to run on a given platform. And given that some of them are like really slow, uh, you can't run all of them either. Uh, so it's yeah, kind of hard. Um, there's a lot of ramp up time to be able to like get to a state where you have a sufficient enough test suits. And it's even harder considering that there's no test suite that any driver must pass. So ideally we should be able to have a test that says, okay, if you want to have a KMS driver, this is a minimal su test suite that basically um, any driver must, 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 must validate, um, and we don't have that. And then you have more uh, like features that are missing a bit from IGT, but are not really missing, it's more of a, because of the entire design. Um, it's, it's mostly tests for the user space API and the driver behavior. Um, so, um, for example, in some situations where, like I said, we wouldn't have enabled the AGMI scrambler, uh, basically the driver is completely happy about it. Um, the user space API is going to work fine. Uh, the driver will be working fine as well. The controller won't report any error. Everything is doing great, except you don't have anything on your display and the display got broken. Um, so there's a few um, tools and components that we can use in order to um, remove that a bit. Um, the first one is VKMS, which is a virtual KMS driver in tree. And uh, VKMS can actually look at the output of VKMS um, because it's entirely virtual. But since it's an entire, entirely separate driver, it doesn't really test the drivers themselves, but more the core in depth, which is great already, but yeah, we never test the actual drivers. And then you have another feature of DRM, which is write back, which is kind of useful for this as well. It's basically you would tell, take the output right before it goes to the um, display interface and put back the content into a buffer. So it allows you to capture into memory the what would be the output that gets on that display interface, um, except most of the time it's going to be at the end of the CRC. Um, so it won't be able to test, um, back to my example, we wouldn't have been able to test the AGMI controller driver, and so we wouldn't have be able to, like, detect that it was completely broken using a write back. So it's still better than nothing, um, but it's not complete. So it's really more of a test to see if the driver reports, well, can detect an error and reports it, and if it behaves properly, and not really if the result is, and by result I mean what is actually displayed on the monitor or panel or whatever, is actually valid. Um, there's some kind of device that could um, help with this too, which is called the Chameleon, which is made by Google. Um, and it basically uh, fake um, a display and will be able through an FPGA um, to retrieve the frame, compute the CRCs, and then allow someone to pull them from the network. So IGT has support for this, and we'll run a few tests on the device under test, um, get back the frame, compare what has been sent, what has been received, and see if it matches. Um, however, the Chameleon has several uh, 
fairly big drawback. The two, three main ones being that it's fairly expensive and very difficult to source. Um, you basically have to ask Google every time. Uh, and I'm not sure they would be able to provide something like 20 or 30 of them if you want, if you ask them. And then it has a limited number of inputs. It's just HDMI, DisplayPort, and VGA, which is great, again, but it doesn't allow you to test MyPi DSi, LVDS, um, RGB, um, those kind of connections. It requires a network connection between the device under test and the Camellia, which we don't always have. And it's fairly difficult to extend since it's PHDL. Um, and so since it's difficult to extend, we can't have a lot of tests in there either. So it's definitely much better again, but still far from perfect. And so we end up with a few blind spots uh, with IGT, which is that it's difficult to set up for part-time developers. Uh, it's downright impossible to deploy on some platforms um, or devices. Uh, and it might not be even able to tell that the hardware doesn't output anything and so that the output is completely broken. So like I said, with scrambers, uh, you have the same issue, for example, with a parallel bus where you basically just send data over that bus and you have no way to tell. Um, the panel doesn't give you back any anything. So if you mm, misconfigure the timings or clock polarities, for example, or stuff like that, you have no way to tell that something is broken um, using IGT. Um, and so if we had some kind of ideal world, or at least in my ideal world, we'd basically need a tool that has a few requirements. The first one is that it can be deployed easily on any platform, um, any platform supported by KMS. Um, so it's basically ARM, MIPS, and x86. Um, with a novel size of several tens of megabytes, um, something like that, so something still reasonable, but where you could still pack a few features. It can it could run without network, and it can be cross-compiled easily. Um, that's for the deployment side, uh, but ideally it wouldn't have any ramp-up time or internal knowledge needed for the tool itself. Um, so you would basically just run it and it would give you whether it succeeds or not. And it can test uh, the driver output optionally um, with quite cheap hardware and easy to source. So I worked on something like this for the last year or so, um, and so I'm going to suggest a solution. Um, so uh, the main plan is that we definitely have to keep IGT. Uh, it's a full test suite, it's comprehensive. Um, the policy to add every test to IGT is great. We definitely need to keep it. Uh, we just need a tool in addition to it that can be easy to deploy on any platform of any architecture using KMS. Um, so it would be useful on that lame embedded device um, and could be deployed on that lame embedded device and would work okay. Um, where all the KMS drivers are expected to pass all the tests. Um, so some, something like what V4L2 has been doing for using V4L2 compliance and CEC compliance. Um, so they have those tools that will basically exert the user space API, um, pass all the tests, uh, and it's a requirement when you actually submit a, um, a driver there that those tests are passing before even merging it. It's something that we would that would be valuable for us. Uh, where we could, like I said, using a hundred bucks um, device, um, test the display output without network, um, because not all of the devices are using it, and can test internal um, interfaces. So like LVDS, uh, RGB, MyPy, DSi, and so on. Um, so the architecture I've been working on has basically three components. Uh, so two software ones and a hardware ones. Um, so the 
first one is the two that we run on the device under test that would optionally connect um, and uh, interact with an hardware board that is there to capture the dot output. And finally, a tool that would run on that board that captures and processes the frames to make sure that they are proper. Um, so the tool that is running on the dot is, um, it's basically where we have our strict uh, deployment requirements. And I've been working on a REST application because REST here is very valuable. Um, because uh, Rust can be statically compiled uh, without any dependency. Um, the only dependency is the C library, and it can work with several of them. So for example, if that platform has Muscle instead of the GDC, it works. Um, it can be cross-compiled uh, very easily. It's basically just a flag on the uh, Rust compiler, and, and that's it. And it can be deployed by just copying that device, uh, that binary um, to the device and it just works. Um, so part of that effort was to come up with a KMS library as well, which is which I did with, and so this application is an atomic KMS application. And in the end, uh, it would be the one that runs all the local tests on the device. And so at the moment, um, what it does is just the test the output part, so it will decode a PNG frame, uh, put it into a frame buffer, output it, and just wait there. Um, and to, so this takes four megabytes with the default flags. So we are definitely having something quite compact here. Um, and it's also one of the rest um, advantages there, um, since it doesn't require any, any kind of runtime or interpreter or anything. Um, yeah. And then we have the prototype itself, so the board, which is uh, based on um, MyPy my CSI bridge. Um, so the first prototype I did was to test HGMI, and but you can find MyPy DSI bridges for pretty much any of the interfaces I've mentioned before, except maybe MyPy DSI. I haven't been able to find any for some reason. Um, and the good thing about it is that you can find very easily, um, even like if you just want to buy one of those bridges from Farnell, of those bridges. Uh, and MyPy CSI capture is also fairly um, widespread among uh, platforms these days. Basically, any cheap embedded SOC arm from ARM um, will have MyPy CSI at some point. Um, so it's fairly easy to source. And so the prototypes. I did were based on a Raspberry Pi and an HDMI to MyPy CSI bridge, and it's been working great so far. And so on the capture side, I've used Rust as well, and it's a Rust before L2 application. Um, it runs basically a configurable test scenario uh, where it will first set up the bridge, um, set up the EDIDs in that bridge, so generate and program them into the bridge start the capture interface and then wait for frame to arrive. Uh, once the frames arrived, it will uh, process them and make sure that they are valid um, and until um, that test scenario is, is done. Um, and so the frame validation is, I'm sure, going to be controversial because it's fairly um, subjective. But the way I did it was that every frame sent by the dot is going to contain a header. This header will contain um, a counter and a hash. Um, and so the validation is basically making sure the hash is correct and that the frames are in order, so we never see a decreasing counter. Um, and so part of what I was skeptical about at first was that I wasn't sure we would be able to run a hash fast enough on those frames to keep up at 60 hertz. Uh, and it turns out that on a Raspberry Pi 4, um, it takes about 5 milliseconds to process a 1080p frame, so well within the 15 to 60 milliseconds um, of budget we have. The Raspberry Pi 3 is slower at around 8 
ish uh, but it still fits which means that with some effort we could probably uh, go to 4k at 60 hertz um, but yeah that would be a bit tight or with require something more powerful um, and so there's definitely some limitation at the moment of this. Um, so it relies on, um, so when it set up the new EDIDs, um, the bridge will toggle the hot plug um, line for 100 milliseconds. And so it basically relies on um, interrupt based hot plug detection to be able to switch resolutions. And so it won't work with devices that rely on pulling from the core, which is bad. Um, and probably something that we will need to address at some point. Um, the validation um, based on a hash is rather fragile um, and we won't be able to test some of the features like color space conversions um, because those would... Yeah, we basically have the assumption that um, the frame is left untouched between the time where our application gives it as a frame buffer to DRM and KMS, and then we retrieve it through V4L2. So um, having color spec conversion in there uh, doesn't work. Um, things like um, having a misconfigured, for example, full range versus limited range RGB will not work either, um, things like this. But it would still allow us to have some kind of validation, even though it's not as uh, wide as we'd like it to be. Um, we don't really have a way to send parameters from the capture side to the dots. For example, expressing something like we want to um, we want you to uh, output for ten seconds and then um, and then shut down for five seconds and then resume. Uh, but it pr could probably be encoded in the EDID somehow. Um, and finally, um, the MyPy CHSI bridges and captured devices for 4K are quite rare. So for now, we'll have to limit ourselves to 180p, which is a good first step, but we probably need to go to 4K at some point. And if we want to work on the additional features, uh, we definitely work to, into integrating it into a CI environment, uh, testing more things, uh, adding support for local tests, um, testing audio and CEC support, uh, testing 4K, and possibly testing the info frames as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I asked for if you have any questions on that slide, but I'm actually also a lot uh, interested in a lot in having your feedback. Um, it's something that I would be really interested to. Do you see any like fatal flaw in this? Uh, are you interested? Do you completely reject it? Um, yeah, so just let me know. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Hey. Thank you very much for your excellent talk. That was improving the Linux display stack reliability by Maxim Report, who is here for the QA session now. Simon says, Sir asks, how difficult it would be to pump out the frames? Are there Raspberry Pi limitations? Uh, bleh, sorry, are there RPEI limitations that would prevent it? Um, sorry. Um, so pumping out the frames actually fairly, fairly easy. Um, we just get a V4L2 buffer. Um, so for now, I'm just accessing it to take the hash, but it would be easy to just like send it over the network, for example, and kind of emulate what the Camellia has been doing, for example. So yeah, accessing the actual frames is fairly easy. It's not implemented at the moment, but it could be yeah easy to do. Okay, and one more question from Simon Sarah. Are any plans to just adapt HD instead with build flux, etc.? I think it's a bit unfortunate to end up with fragmented test suits. Yeah, I kind of agree with the feeling, um, but it just felt like a really daunting task. Um, so, for example, just getting it to cross compile easily and be able to be 
embedded in a fairly simple system was like, well, at least a bit too much for me. Um, and then we could definitely have an AGT, for example, must pass list like we discussed and Daniel suggested as well. Um, so I guess it's it's really just um, whether it's worth it um, or not. And it didn't really feel like it for me, but maybe others will like, disagree with me on this. Um, yeah. Okay, it looks like that's it for the questions. So thank you very much for the talk and have a great rest of the conference. Thanks. Have a nice afternoon.